Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Okay, welcome everyone to part three of the Myth Bust Monday season one finale. In this video, we're gonna take on the final eight myths we've covered in the 25 episode series so far. And this will officially mark the end of season one. I'm thinking that season two should boot back up sometime in the middle of 2019. And I'm hoping to debut my new Technique Tuesday series a little later this month. Um, so as before, I'm gonna skip many of the details here. Uh, so just make sure you check out the corresponding link to the full length video for each topic in the description box below if you'd like more of that detail. Uh, but without further ado, here we go. Uh, so up first is the idea that you should eat breakfast to sort of provide the nutrients you need to get your day started off on the right foot. And while it sounds perfectly reasonable, and I'm sure we've all heard it plenty, as it turns out, it doesn't have much scientific legitimacy. A research from Betts and colleagues found no difference in resting metabolic rate between groups eating and skipping breakfast which makes up the biggest chunk of total metabolism here. And while this study did find that breakfast eaters moved around more and burn more calories during the day, this was nearly perfectly offset by the fact that they also overate by about the same number of calories because of the calories included in the breakfast meal. So on balance under free living conditions, there actually isn't much of a difference in total daily energy balance between eating and skipping breakfast. So whether you choose to eat or skip should be tailored to your appetite and your preferences. And I think a Weightology Research Review article from James Krieger summarized this well. Eating breakfast is a personal preference. If you eat breakfast, make it large and high in protein. And if you don't, just make sure your first meal of the day is large and high in protein. Uh, but ultimately, skipping breakfast is just one strategy to reduce caloric intake, and you'll need to determine whether skipping breakfast helps you eat less overall during the day. Um, so this has been a controversial one for me. Uh, in the original video, I laid out four studies examining targeted fat loss. So the idea that you can selectively lose fat from specific body parts. Uh, the first study found that active swinging arms weren't leaner than non-active non-swinging arms in tennis players. Uh, but this study was limited by being merely observational, not interventional. Uh, the second study showed that when you only train one arm across 12 weeks, you don't find any difference in fat volume between the trained and untrained arm. Uh, but this study was also limited because it didn't find much fat loss overall. So perhaps spot reduction just wasn't detected here. Now in contrast, this third study did see significant overall fat loss and again, didn't find spot reduction in trained versus untrained legs. However, a new study published just last year really applied pressure to these earlier findings when one group that trained upper body only for 12 weeks lost way more arm fat and another group that trained lower body only for 12 weeks lost way more leg fat, implying that local targeted fat reduction was at play, which I think maybe it was. Now, an important detail here is that all subjects performed 30 minutes of light cycling after training, implying that perhaps the body does increase fat mobilization from stores nearby the exercising muscle. And if it's burned as fuel immediately after training, this could lead to more net fat loss in that specific area. Um, but to me, I think this is mostly just boiled down to a new launching pad for future research. Um, this paper did have a small sample size and is running counter to the general scientific consensus up to this point. Um, so despite impressive findings here, um, still not confident actually making the recommendation that you can selectively target body fat. And so I'm just gonna leave a highly skeptical question mark on this one for now. So similar to whether fresh or frozen produce is better, uh, which cooking method is best is gonna depend on what specific food you're looking at. Uh, on the whole, it seems that steaming is slightly better for preserving nutrients and boiling seems to be the worst, especially for water soluble vitamins like vitamin C. And of course this supports the general advice that you should avoid high heat and lots of water when cooking. Um, also there's no reason to avoid the microwave. That's a safe technology and can often have favorable effects on nutrition. Um, so generally speaking, I think the best advice is to simply have a diet filled with a variety of different fruits and vegetables and try to use a variety of different cooking methods when you can. So I don't personally like the eight glasses per day water recommendation. 
uh, because it doesn't account for the fact that water requirements will vary from person to person based on size, activity level, even geographical location and climate. Uh, so based on pretty much every academic source that I've read, uh, most healthy people can adequately meet their daily water intake by simply using thirst as a guide. And several sources have noted that coffee should count as a water source since it doesn't increase urine output or negatively affect hydration status in those accustomed to consuming caffeine. And of course, since dehydration levels as low as 3% has been shown to impair athletic performance, including strength and power, uh, it's important that strength trainees stay well hydrated. Uh, Alan Aragon's research review makes a specific pre and intra workout recommendation. Uh, but I personally prefer Lyle McDonald's advice that your pee should be clear or slightly yellow throughout the whole day and you should be peeing about five times a day. Uh, also increasing water intake has a near negligible effect on metabolic rate. So increasing it past that needed to quench your thirst won't do anything extra for fat loss. Of course, unless it helps you feel fuller and reduces your total daily caloric intake overall. Um, so I'd say other than my sugar video, uh, my video on milk probably drew the most controversy in this series. I actually found that surprising since many of the high quality meta-analyses and systematic reviews we have, including this one with over 700,000 participants, all have consistently found no association between dairy and milk consumption and all-cause mortality or total deaths, coronary heart disease, and cardiovascular disease. Now, in the ensuing commentary that followed my milk video, uh, many, many people pointed out the potential for funding bias from the dairy industry and then used that to discredit this entire body of data. Uh, but as I said in the original video, while potential for funding bias should give us legitimate pause and encourage us to look at data sets with less bias risk, uh, it can't discredit a well done study on its own unless there's also evidence of malpractice. Uh, but in this case, this actually isn't much of a concern because there actually is other high quality data without funding conflicts showing the same basic findings. And the counter evidence that I've seen, uh, almost without exception, coming from vegans or vegetarians, such as this very popular China study, is pervaded with vegan or vegetarian ideologically driven bias, pulling whatever it wants from 8,000 correlations, cherry picking references and omitting data. Um, so I would say, despite the concerning ethical shortcomings of the dairy industry, um, as I see it, the weight of the scientific evidence still is in support of milk as a nutrient rich beverage that can offer many health benefits to those who choose to consume it. Um, so the idea that there are three distinct body types or somatotypes, so the endomorph, mesomorph, and ectomorph, is based on some old eugenics riddled pseudoscience from the 1940s, where the goal is to associate each body type with personality, intelligence, future achievement, etc. And it later caught footing in the fitness industry and bodybuilding community. Now, the main issue that I have is that these body type classifications tend to imply that you can't change your body composition or even your body shape over time, which you clearly can. Uh, of course, you can't change your bone structure or the way your muscles insert, uh, but whether you currently look like an endo or an ecto, you will still lose body fat by putting yourself in a caloric deficit and you'll still build muscle through progressive resistance exercise while eating sufficient protein and calories. And while the actual results may come more and less easily to different individuals based on genetic differences, differences in actual training protocols should be based on specific goals level of advancement and personal preference, not somatotypes. Um, so I really wouldn't recommend doing a detox diet. Uh, first, they can be dangerous, especially if they have you drinking way more water than you need or excessively restricting foods. Um, their entire basis comes from the faulty physiological assumption that the liver and kidneys need any help clearing out toxins, which they don't. And while they may lead to short-term rapid weight loss for some, due to the extreme caloric restriction. Uh, these diets are rarely, if ever, sustainable over the long term and often lead to weight regain. And given that there is a huge list of other weight loss diets with adequate protein and micronutrition, pretty much any weight loss diet you can pick at random will be better than even the best detox diet out there. Um, so not a big fan of those, although in my original video, I do discuss what an actual science-based detox diet 
might look like in the future, if you'd like to check that out. So the last myth actually turns out to probably be not as much of a myth as we once thought it was. Um, as it turns out, the bros were actually kind of onto something when it comes to the mind-muscle connection, as new data shows that you can see significantly more biceps hypertrophy when focusing on establishing a mind-muscle connection. However, this effect may be body part specific since it didn't seem to work as well for the quads in this study. Uh, granted, the subjects were untrained, so perhaps in more experienced bodybuilders who might be better at mindfully activating muscles of their lower body, uh, perhaps you'd see more growth in the quads as well. Um, still, this is a new area of research, so my personal recommendation is to not use the mind-muscle connection for all exercises, but rather just reserve it for isolation, single joint exercises that have rep counts higher than eight. And for everything else, for the most part, you wanna just focus on how your body is executing the movement as a whole, ensuring proper technique and lifting tempo. All right, so that's the final eight fitness myths covered. And that's gonna be a wrap for this season of Myth Bust Monday. Uh, it's been a ton of fun producing this series and the last year has just totally flown by. I'm really looking to elevate the content and production value in season two. Uh, so I'm really excited for that. Um, anyway, before we go, I wanna give a huge shout out to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Uh, Squarespace is the all-in-one website platform that I've been using to run jeffnipper.com and I've been using them for at least the last three or four years. Um, they have really sleek designer custom templates, 24-hour customer support, and just the entire process of running my website and online store really couldn't be more simple through them. Um, so if you guys are wanting to get started with your own website, you can go to squarespace.com forward slash nippered and that'll save you 10% off your first purchase over there. Uh, so thank you so much Squarespace for all your support on the Mythbust Monday series and the channel in general. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, don't forget to leave me a like if you enjoyed the video. I'm going to be back next Monday with a new training vlog. Um, so I'll see you guys all here then.